Hi everyone, welcome to our third summary lecture for our third module of Computer Mediated Communication and Professional Identity. That is a mouthful. Um, I'm excited to close things up with what I think we've been building up for all summer semester. <laughs> you can tell what's on my brain. Hold on one second. Let me go ahead. Um, share my screen here. Okay, so I just want to start off with a little bit of review. So we've talked about a lot of these concepts before. Um, a lot of the things we're going to talk about today, like authenticity, like these are all things that came up when you did your micro celebrity um, evaluation. Um, but this is just going to be a little bit more like intensely focused on you. So we're going to be talking about some of the same things, but there's going to be a lot more emphasis in this unit on like trying to help you sort of work through what your personal branding is, what your personal brand is and how you brand that, I should say. Um, so just a little bit of review, and this is really important. Um, to remind everyone, you know, a lot of people think that when you talk about a brand, you're thinking about like a logo, like the Nike brand is the swoosh or, you know, McDonald's is the golden arches. And these images that we associate with the brand, um, a lot of people think that that is the brand, um, which kind of makes sense because remember, you know, branding comes from this idea of branding cattle and, you know, you know, etching your initials in an animal, weird. Um, but really, you know, th the best way to think about what a brand is, and this includes self-branding, is thinking about a brand as um, a perception that you associate with something. So uh, yes, certainly images can conjure up these things. You know, you associate different things with the logo that's supposed to sort of stand in for the brand, but the brand itself at its core is usually linked to some sort of um, emotion or um, perception of of the the things that you tend to feel when you think about the brand. So, McDonald's brand is not the Golden Arches. McDonald's brand could be fun or family. Um, and another thing I really think is important to because uh, it's going to come in a, a lot into the the personal branding stuff that you're going to be doing is a brand is also what sets something apart from other related brands. So um, McDonald's, for instance, like some of you, when we were doing the um, reflection activity on, okay, well, what's, you know, McDonald's brand would say like, well, convenience, which to be fair, I would agree that, you know, McDonald's definitely wants you to associate convenience with their brand, but is that the core of their brand? Because I would argue that any sort of convenient fast food restaurant, you know, is trying to market convenience. So the question is, is how does McDonald's brand differ from Hardee's or Arby's or, you know, other uh, Chick-fil-A, other types of fast food brands? And um, if you can start getting the sort of those key adjectives in your mind about like, well, you know, um, I was going to say for, Ch for Chick-fil-A expensive, but I know that's not what they're going for either. Um, um, well, actually, but, you know, like part of the, the Chick-fil-A brand is they have um, uh, Christian values, for instance, that might be something that distinguishes them from other fast food places. So um, start thinking about those types of things. Um, and again, a personal brand is the same. It's just kind of, well, what sets you apart from other people? There are certain things that we want everybody to think about us. Um, you know, most people want to be thought of as being honest. Is that necessarily part of your brand? Possibly, right? It's like, are you, is that like what people associate you with as opposed to other people? Then I would say, yeah, now we're talking about, um, a personal brand versus just like a, a good attribute or something. Um, and then of course, you know, we talked about this too at the very beginning of the semester with identity, you know, there's different aspects of our identity that some people see and other people don't. Um, and things that we reveal, things that we can't hide from other people, things we do. Um, similarly, you know, a brand is kind of how you think about yourself, but it's equally how other people see you. Um, so it's kind of, you know, the things that you do to, you know, manage your self-impression, but sometimes there are things that, um, whether it's because of how you manage it or not, it's just sort of like what you put out there into the world. And, you know, your personal brand is kind of like what's in between. Uh, one of the things I'm going to have you do uh, in this unit, um, it, it's very brief. I try not to make you do a whole lot of like extra class type of activities, but I really want you to ask somebody else, um, 
what they think your brand is. And I'm just, it doesn't mean that they're right or, you know, that it has to be something that you take into consideration, but I think it's um, actually really helpful to get sort of like a gut check on how other people see you and to see if that actually resonates with, you know, how you see yourself. Um, okay. So the very first thing you're going to be doing for the first two weeks of this unit is, um, you know, you're going to, you've got this, again, it's nice and thin, but it's like a bunch of blanks. Well, that was a bad example. It's a bunch of blanks in here because you have to sort of like fill things in. Um, this workbook is not something uh, I've, I've been mentioning a lot. It's not something I'm going to like collect or I'm not going to grade your work on it. If you want to go through it and not even like write in it, maybe it's just something you want to sit down with and spend some time contemplating. There are some questions a lot that I have up here that I want you to focus particularly on. And if you go through the other uh, questions in here, it might help you, it might lead you to sort of, you know, what you're going to say for the questions that I do care a little bit more about. These are questions, um, the ones I have on the slide here, these are questions that I do on, to some extent, want you to address uh, in your final paper, which is going to be a self, a personal branding, self-branding audit um, at the end of the semester. So um, I do want you to focus a little bit more on these, but it, it's kind of hard, honestly, to come up with the answers to some of these without focusing on some other questions. Like um, this example right here, you, you know, the first part of um, what you're going to be doing in this workbook, it does ask you to like, okay, well, if you had to come up with some sort of elevator pitch where like a short paragraph or maybe even just a personal brand statement, kind of like a company has a mission statement, you know, it's like, what is it? Like if you had to sort of encapsulate it to, uh, you know, give to somebody you just met or to promote yourself in an interview or maybe to advertise on a website or something like what would that be and i don't know if that's going to be something you can come up with without going through some of the other um, activities if you will in here so just keep that in mind um and then there's questions that in the second part like i divided the assignments up into um kind of like splitting the workbook where the first part you're just talking about what is your brand? And then the second part, you're trying to think about like, okay, well, what does it look like? And how do I communicate that brand? So the second part, you're going to think a lot more about like, okay, now that I know what my brand is, what are the visuals that are associated with it? Like, what kind of logo do I need? McDonald's have has the golden arches. Like, if there was a logo for me, what would it be? What would it look like? Would it look um, cartoonish? Would it look, you know, sort of like trendy and sharp and modern and, you know, like those types of questions, what sort of colors would you associate with your brand? If part of your brand is warmth, obviously you wouldn't want to have cold colors, you know, I mean, um, just things like that, because again, like going back to that, um, first slide, all of this is perceptual and, you know, all of the nonverbal ways that you communicate your brand, as well as the verbal ways, all sort of feed in to the same perception or they should, and that should all be really consistent. So um, anyway, so that that's really the, the first two weeks in this unit. That's what you're going to be doing. You're going to be going through this workbook. You're going to be thinking about the questions. Some of these questions I've repeated on, um, you know, your ref weekly reflections. Um, but most of them, you're just going to be kind of, this is a self-guided um, activity. Um, yeah, I do. I mean, you know, the truth is, it's not like this, this workbook is not like revolutionary. It um, is pretty simple, but it is very comprehensive. It's the type of stuff that if I was teaching this class in person, I would actually want us to do as a group to sort of talk to each other and like brainstorm about like some of these questions and compare notes and stuff like that. Um, because I think there's some really thoughtful uh, questions here, but again, it's really nothing like earth shattering. I don't think it'll um, be too difficult, but I do hope it'll be um, somewhat enriching. And um, that is going to be a big part of your final paper uh, for that third integration paper, because you're going to want to describe a lot of the things that you do in this workbook. So, okay. The rest of the semester here, the rest of the unit and the rest of the semester, um, our, it's a, every week I, I try to assign readings that, um, would help you, first of all, learn some theory, some really important theory about computer mediated communication, which, um, you know, like I, I always say it's a stupid name for, uh, basically social media psychology. 
but like computer mediated, it's just like a lot. Basically, it's like the psychology of social media. So I wanted you to become familiar with some basic um, theoretical points that if you are trying to think about managing your personal brand online, I think are um, different types of situations and challenges that you want to keep in mind while you're thinking about the best way to leverage your brand and to communicate your brand in online spaces. Um, the first one of these, and it's very possible you may have learned this in some of your other classes, because um, it's just a really, um, if you're going to talk about like, okay, well, uh, what do I need to know about social media in terms of how it complicates the communication situation where you want to promote yourself? I'd say like, this is just one of those buzz buzzwords, context collapse. Um, context collapse is basically uh, any time that you have a different part of your social life that merges with a different part of your social life that you normally try to keep separate, that's context collapse. Those social contexts are kind of collapsing into each other. So an, an offline example of this, we've all like context collapse has always been a thing. Like um, anytime you go to a wedding or a funeral, for instance, you know, you're likely to see people from different parts of your life. Normally your family doesn't get to um, maybe see your friends a lot, right? You've got a friend group, you've got a family group. Um, if you go to, if you have a wedding, those people are going to come together. They might end up sitting at the same table together. Um, and the reason this matters is because, you know, normally we are very often trying to segment, segment our impression management. So the way that I talk to my husband is not the way that I talk to my colleagues. Usually uh, the way that I, um, you know, dress at home is not the way that I dress for, well, actually, no, it's, these are all bad examples for me because I kind of, well, we'll talk, we could talk about that later. Context collapse is something that particularly challenges me. But um, imagine, for instance, if I was wor working for, um, you know, like a really fancy like Wall Street company and, you know, I had to wear suits and stuff like that. It's kind of like the way that I present myself at work would be dramatically different from the way that I present myself around my friends and things like that. So, um that's why this is important because when the context collapses, we don't have those boundaries that make it easy for us to just know how we're supposed to present ourselves. And this is relevant to computer mediated communication because social media was really like, that was kind of one of the really big shifts. We always had context collapse, but it was in these um, limited events usually, right? Um, social media made context collapse fairly regular. When, you know, MySpace, if any of you remember that, when MySpace came along, you know, okay, maybe you first started signing up for it and it was only your friends, but then, oh gosh, wait, what's my mom doing on MySpace or Facebook or these things? And, and actually, right, what some people, the way that some people responded was actually like by moving, right? It's like if the, if the context becomes so collapsed that it just becomes too difficult to manage my self-presentation that I don't want to manage it at all, then some people might move. Other people, though, might actually take that as an opportunity. Um, one of the things I, you know, uh, the reading that you're going to get into talks about is how there is a difference between intentional collusion and unintentional collision. It's so confusing. They're both C's. I know. Um, context collapse. Like, sometimes we want this to happen. Um, and, you know, I have examples down here about how each social network site kind of has its own norms for context collapse. So context collapse, like on a site like Facebook or Twitter, um, like it's normative there. Um, it's not necessarily intentional though. So, you know, you might go on Facebook and you're like, oh, okay, well, you know, I'm going to just keep things private and I'm just going to make it so that only my friends can see it and not realize, for instance, that through your friends, you know, people who your colleagues might also be able to see, right? So a lot of unintentional context collapse can happen in different spaces. But sometimes if you're talking about like LinkedIn, the whole point is context collapse, right? You want people from different social settings to kind of see what you're all about, right? But the nice thing is, is on LinkedIn, most people are sort of like, well, I'm just presenting my professional identity. So it's not that much of a problem either. Right. Um, but the whole the, the bottom line is context collapse is going to affect your self-presentation uh, 
uh, decisions. If you are in a situation like on most social network sites where you are not going to be, or it's well, it's not that you're not going to be able to, but it is more complicated to manage all of the different social contexts that you normally find yourself in and to um, make decisions about which part of yourself or your brand that you want to present, then, um, you know, context collapse is going to affect sort of what sites you choose to use or how you choose to use them. Um, on this note, so the the other reading that came that, that's assigned for the same ring, assigned for the same week, sorry, is a reading by um, Dana Boyd. Um, and she deliberately, you can see up here, she deliberately signs her um, uh, not sign well i'm sure she signs her names but she spells her names with all lowercase letters on purpose um there whatever that's a whole that's a whole different story uh but i just didn't want you to think i was making typos um and she's a pretty um well-known uh sociologist of social media and you know she wrote this book um which is a little dated i know because like 2014 social media has changed so much and yet even though she's talking about platforms that teens were using at the time that maybe aren't as popular for teens now. I think that the things she's talking about are still very relevant. And even though in this chapter, she's talking about how teens negotiate their identity online and how they navigate these difficult situations, even though it's about teens, and she mentions this once, like I, I think there's a lot for us to learn about it too. She's trying to explain based on her research why teens kind of act weird on social media and why it seems that like they don't care for instance about like impressions as much as maybe we think they should or, or and things like that and you know she brings up a lot and these are just a couple of things but um there are more and you can talk about any of them for your reflection if you want um she she talks a lot of, about a lot of things that social media has complicated that made makes it such that um, right. It, you know, when you're socially developing and you don't sort of have like, you know, clearly defined context, there's a lot of, um, there's a lot of, you know, uh, there's a learning curve, if you will, about how to present yourself. So one of the um, points she brings up is like, you know, everybody has an imagined audience. Whenever you post something on social media, you have some sort of audience in your head. Um, but the audiences that you are thinking about when you're making messages aren't necessarily your actual audiences, right? So a lot of times, let's say that you want to like brag about an award you got or something like that on social media, and you're thinking to yourself, oh, so-and-so is going to love this, you know, um, grandma's going to be so proud, whatever the case is, right? Um, that's not like, they might be part of your actual audience, but part of the problem that she brings up is like the People that we don't see are could still be there. And we tend to base our imagined audiences on the people that we see, not the people that we don't. So there's a lot of people lurking out there who are not visible. And so we don't really think about them when we are posting. And of course, that is a problem that everybody gets into. Um, teens in particular, it is interesting because she brings up the point that it's like they're still sort of in this whole world bubble where the only people they know are like friends from school. You know what I mean? Like they haven't, once you get out there and, and you've got um, all different types of, um, well, once you, as you grow up and your life becomes more complicated in terms of the different people that you sort of bring along in your life, um, it becomes even more relevant, but it's not something that's a salient to them yet. Um, and the other thing is like, you know, the, the network nature of social network sites make, makes, makes this extra complicated because as we talked about, even if you have a really clear idea about who your actual audience is, let's say there's not a big discrepancy between who you imagine it is and who it is. The whole point is these are social network sites, which means that your friends who you're connected to have their own audience and they are connected to you. So there are people that you can't even imagine out there who, because they're not in your they're not not only in your imagined audience, they're not even in the actual audience of your inner social network circle. Um, so anyway, so self-presentation, you know, has to be constructed in a way that's sort of like bearing in mind all of these different unknowns with your audience. And um, again, for teens, that's really complicated, but um, I think it's complicated for adults too. The good news is though, and she does bring up, 
this one young One Direction fan who she called uh, a typical internet savvy internet user, um, a, a typical savvy internet user who, you know, she, she was applauding this young girl who um, sort of had an understanding that she was a big fan girl of One Direction and she knew that her friends didn't give a rat's ass about One Direction. So what she had done was she had sort of created online spaces for herself where she could go and have that social context for One Direction and actually segment it away from her friends that didn't care about it. And listen, that's another beauty of social media is it does, if we do, we have privacy tools, we have um, tools to, we have a, a different, you know, groups and, and, and places, if you will, that we can go to help us manage our audience. But I just want to say again, that that's one way to sort of be savvy about all this. If you're trying to manage context collapse by just saying, well, I'm just going to engage in extra segmenting um, behaviors, that's completely acceptable. Some of you might embrace context collapse. Some of you might feel when you are thinking about your own personal brand, that actually what would be the most advantageous is for you to pick one, I'm not, I don't mean this as a negative, but one pretty generic brand that everybody in your social life can sort of get behind. Um, there's complications with that too, because again, you have to manage, you know, all of these unknowns, like your connections of your connections, but um, it is possible. Um, and this is a great segue into, okay, so now, um, the we're going into another week of readings now where I just picked out some things that I think are really extra important considerations. We've talked about authenticity in the past um, and how it's important, right? People, especially online where people always are afraid of being deceived, you know, having, um, being able to gain uh a percent like being able to have people think of you as authentic is very advantageous and a lot of you when you talked about your micro celebrities talked about how your micro celebrities you know um, the, the, these people that you follow for advice or for fun all sort of gave off this really genuine um impression how they worked to be honest and not rehearsed and and you talked about a lot of different ways that they did this um the point that you're reading here makes is like, you know, we talked about this too. I remember my last slides, we talked about how authenticity staged. Well, these authors are like, yeah, authenticity. I mean, I'm, my interpretation of the reading is they're pretty much like authenticity really isn't real, ironically. Like that's the paradox. Like it's, it's something that we all like strive for because I think it makes us feel good too. Um, but it's kind of impossible because the there's a paradox, there's a contradiction in terms of like, what is required to be successful on social media that is authentic that people don't like. So for instance, um, there's something called a positivity bias. There's a lot of research that suggests that people get really turned off if people share like unpleasant information on social media. And honestly, I'm not even talking about the stuff that makes you mad, but that could be it too. But you know, Facebook has leveraged that for years. Um, Although they've gotten a little better, uh, but the negative, I mean, personal negative information, painful self-disclosures, uh, people don't feel less comfortable when people share information about illnesses and bad things that have, that have happened. Now there are exceptions, right? People, um, are, you know, need to know about like big events, but if somebody just sort of like comes on social media and is just sharing about how bad their day was every day, you, you would probably not want to follow that person anymore because that's not the norm of social media. But back to the paradox, isn't that authentic? <laughs> you know, if we're always sort of trying to walk around on social media and adhere to this positivity bias, then how can we ever truly be authentic? If you know, authenticity requires sharing both positive and negative experiences, right? Um, so that's sort of the paradox. Um, it's really what we're striving for is a perception of authenticity, um, which, you know, does require some balance. You know, if you never posted anything negative, it probably wouldn't, you know, seem very authentic, but we have to make this, you know, there's, there's a balance, but it's not an equal balance. It's like a positive 
balanced with negative down here, you know? Um, so anyway, so online authenticity, they would argue is usually not achievable. Um, and context collapse makes this even worse because, you know, again, before we had all of these spaces with context collapse, we didn't have to worry about presenting one authentic self because we could have different selves for different contexts. But when the context collapse, we have to make some decisions about what we're gonna present and what we're not. How can we present a single authentic self that everybody will find accept acceptable no matter what context they're in, but is that really authentic if we have to manicure it that much? So um, anyway, um, interestingly enough though, there's, um, <laughs> you know, I mentioned before, we, we, people tend to be very skeptical of other people in online contexts. And if you take a computer mediated communication theory class, where that's all we talk about. We'll talk about things like, oh, well, it's because honestly, humans have a weird thing when somebody's body is missing. You know, the thing about being in online spaces is there's a lot of affordances where people can doctor images or they can um, edit what they're what they're going to say before they say it. And there's all these like um, tricks, if you will, to manage our impressions. So people, I think, are a little bit more wary about being deceived. Um, but they're savvy about this. And there's something called warranting theory, which actually says that when people post things online, um, they might believe it. But if somebody else posts the same thing, about them, that information is instantly more credible. These are warranting cues. So we think that, for instance, if um, if I post something on Twitter, X, whatever, um, and you know I say something about um, some some accomplishment that I did, um, people will be like, "Oh, cool! She must be really smart or good with animals or whatever I am," but. Um, if somebody else posts it, then it actually get like, it, they're more likely to believe it because we're like, oh, well, if it comes from a different source, then they, why would they lie? Right. It, it, it sort of gets to like their motive. So um, this is why, for instance, we really like, um, this is just a funny example with whole cans. This is why we um, really like online reviews, you know, because if somebody, it, it's one thing, if a company tells you that their product is good. But if all of these users who are not affiliated with the company tell you that it's good, then, well, there must be something to it, right? Um, dating profiles. I mean, well, this is actually like, think about whenever you see somebody tagged in a photo versus they post their own photo. That's actually probably the best example. If somebody posts a photo of themselves, you know that they eh, maybe doctored it a little bit, put on a nice filter, you know, um, it, it was like they're showing their good side. But if they get tagged in somebody else's photo, then it's instantly more likely that you're going to think like, okay, this is what that person really looks like, right? This is this is not just a doctored photo because, right, that other person doesn't have any, um, the same incentive to um, enhance themselves. Um, so that's warranting theory. Um, and then the third reading I assigned in the same bunch is on ambient awareness. I have been using this reading, it's a New York Times article in my social media classes um, since I've been teaching social media um, because to me, it focuses on sort of the magic of using these platforms to um, enhance yourself and connect with other people in a way that I don't think you can in an in, um, in offline context. I mean, you can connect with people, but not in this way. Um, so the, the idea of ambient awareness is that, you know, a lot of people like to like make fun of not so much anymore. I mean, certainly when this article was written in 2008 and we were just getting used to the idea that like people are posting what they had for breakfast and nobody cares, you know, that there was a lot of that going on. But just this idea of like, well, why do people leave these little bits of info me seemingly meaningless information about themselves on social media. Like forget, you know, I was just talking about big events. I'm not talking about births, deaths, and marriages. I'm talking about um, little pieces of information like, you know, funny things your cat did or yeah, what you had for breakfast or, you know, whatever. Um, and this idea of ambient awareness is it's true. 
in isolation, these little bits of information that you put out there don't mean anything. But over time, if people are repeatedly, and that's why I have sort of the droplets here, if they're it's kind of like a network droplet kind of idea is what I'm trying to uh, associate with this. When they leave little bits of information here and there over time, you start to develop a sense of, per of, of a person. You start to um, become in tune with who they are, what their habits are, in a way, by the way, that you don't even have the ability to, let's say, if they are somebody that you work with and you only see them for a little bit of time, but then you're following them on X and you get these little droplets just throughout the week and maybe even at the same times, or you can tell things about their rhythm. You know, you could tell like, well, gosh, they're like really blasting out a lot of tweets right now. They must be agitated because that's not their normal style. You know, it's, it's a different type of communication that comes from a collective social media action, if you will. Um, and this is something that is, is, you know, a product of our micro communications text messages, news feeds. Um, my friends make fun of me all the time for like my style of text messaging, but they also know the times that I text and things that I text about. But really news feeds is, it was the, um, the way that they started thinking about this. And the reason I like to add it in this class is because, you know, one of the things you're going to have to think about for your own personal brand is what content goes with it. So what do you want to say? And also, you know, what is sort of that rhythm that you want to put out there, depending on the platform you're using, of course, um, in order to sort of cultivate and, and, and draw connections with your brand to other people. Um, and understanding that this is a thing is really important, I think, because um, it, it's it's worth not dismissing all of these, again, seemingly small like pieces that actually can culminate into something much larger, I think. I mean, it's kind of idealistic, but I kind of like that stuff, even though I'm going to end on a really not idealistic component in a second. So, um, okay. So the first reading I wanted to talk to you about is a pretty short blog piece. It should not take you that long to read. Um, but really what they're doing here is they're problematizing this whole idea of like what makes something professional or not. Um, I thought this would be a nice thing to sort of in the semester with since you know the class is on cmc and professional identity i think that the whole point was the class was supposed to be um you know uh, something that would help you with your professional goals if that's what you wanted and i get that it's probably just supposed to be like workplace but because the word professional was used i wanted to just like take a moment to sort of like pick at it for just a second um because there is a lot of criticism about how um, we use professionalism as a standard that could really stifle a lot of individuality and creativity um, because a lot of people have sort of rigid standards about what makes something professional. Um, just funny, and I, I like really wanted to put like these like ha ha ha's right here to make it clear that I really didn't think it's funny. When I was looking for images for this uh, PowerPoint slide, I just did like a Google image search for professionalism and like the fifth one down was like this. And I was like, oh God, well, this proves the point exactly you know it's kind of like these like literal white collar <laughs> like white collar people wearing suits white people um you know older dude like telling everybody sharing his wisdom with people i mean like so this is the idea of like what professionalism is i mean that's like extreme i do understand that but um there are you know the idea of professionalism can be weaponized i guess you could say to um put down difference and and maybe things that it's like oh well if it's you know uh if it doesn't fit in with like this rigid sort of corporate professional culture um then it's not considered professional when really you know if you actually look at like and i did but this isn't part of the blog if you go and look at definitions of professionalism like they're good things from professionalism civility like the way that we treat other people in professional spaces, you know, but when we start talking about professionalism as some sort of culture, um, it could end up penalizing other types of cultural experiences. Um, people, you know, the article brings up how um, people who have different hairstyles, different modes of dress, who um, are neurodivergent and have different ways of communicating, all of these things could be penalized um, if we adhere to professionalism too much. And thinking 
full circle back to your self branding goals, you know, um, I do think these are all things you want to keep in mind as you think about who your audiences are, what they consider to be professional. But I also want you to, you know, sort of be critical about what really is professional and what's not, what's good for your brand, what is sort of the professionalism that you see for you, and maybe not subscribe to these more um, institutional modes of professionalism. And finally, um, the the next um, article it was more of an article, not a blog post. Anne Helen Peterson, she's um she used to be one of my people. She used to be an academic, academic, but she left academia. Um, and now, she, and I think she worked for BuzzFeed for a while, which is where this article's from. And um, she's since started to do a lot of um, a lot of writing on. She has like a podcast, I think, or something on labor. And, you know, criti being critical of a lot of labor practices. And um, this article you'll see talks about a lot more than just personal branding. She's really trying to make an argument that, you know, even though millennials and the generations that come after them sort of have this um, reputation for being lazy, I think her general argument is like, actually, that's not true the expectations for sort of what the what her gen her well i think her generation is more i don't know if i'm a millennial i think i like like one rung above or something but um what the millennial generation has been put up with uh the situation they put into is actually not that they're lazy at all it's that they're sort of like you know i guess you could say micro abused with different types of labor so one of those forms of labor is she talks about personal branding um and she probably, you know, she doesn't talk extensively about it, but I think what she does say is worth really considering, which is that, you know, personal branding is not just some, it's something we do in a large part for our professional lives. It's something that we need in order to get jobs. Um, a lot of us do. It's something that um, we do because we're interested in sort of promoting ourselves and getting ahead in some way. Otherwise, I don't think we'd really be talking about it, right? We wouldn't need to... Um, package ourselves like that. But in doing so, she makes a good point. It does kind of turn us into a commodity, right? And not only that, but personal branding isn't something that we leave at the workplace. It's um, work that we do constantly. It's work that we do outside of work and we aren't compensated for, even though for many of you, if you are engaged in some personal branding activities, it could benefit your organization. Um, I don't do a lot of it anymore. I did when I was um, uh, I did when I was younger, when I was first like on the market to get a job as a professor. And, um, you know, the, the truth is, is it did like a university is a great example when professors engage in a lot of good self branding. It's good, not just for the professors, but for the institution. So there's reasons that institutions should encourage this, but you don't get compensated for it. And as she points out, it really blurs the boundaries between work and home even more because you're sort of when you're engaged in personal branding, everything is a personal branding opportunity. It means everything that you post is either for or against that brand or somewhere in between, right? You're sort of like always working, always on the clock. Um, so these are just all things to remember. This isn't, you know, she, I don't even, she brands herself all the time. I, I don't think the point is to um, say that nobody should brand until somebody starts paying you for your social media accounts, I, you know, until you become a micro celebrity and start getting sponsorship deals or something like that. I don't think that's the point at all. I do think, though, that it's always healthy to just sort of be critical about, you know, how these um, new expectations for personal branding play into um, our work-life um, balance. So, and that is it. That is a wrap, folks. We are officially done um, with all of the content and the course, and this is the last summary lecture. So congratulations. Um, thank you so much. I'm looking forward to reading those self-branding papers. Okay, bye.